Gilet. Uh, yeah. Gilet. yeah. Gilet is much more expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's not a Cannondale, it's a Cannondale. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Duras, it's Durachi. <laughs> Welcome now to the Crank Revolution Podcast, your source for cycling shenanigans. Listen now to our hosts, the purveyors of pedals, as we teach you more about cycling every single episode. So sit right back, pop a cold one, and enjoy our show. And we are back with another exciting episode of Crank Revolution Podcast. You know why this is kind of a scary time of year for me? Why is that? scary? Well, because this is when my mind has the most time. In in a bike <laughs> shop, when you're going into Christmas, you're always thinking about Christmas sales and, and Thanksgiving and Black Friday and all these other things. For me, right after Christmas, until you get to that March, April, where the season might start, you have a ton of time. And the problem is, too, the weather starts getting nice, and my brain starts to dream up what I want to do this year. Mm-hmm get real excited yeah it doesn't take the weather getting nice it just takes that lull of of doing stuff around the house doing stuff at the bike garage my mind starts wandering going oh what can i do yes. what can i build you start cleaning which means that you just dig through your stash of yeah. parts and you're like okay i can oh i can put these together that could, this be, could a be, bike. be something that, that could, could be, be a bike yeah you start building bikes around <laughs> like i have this hub Okay, cool. That's a new bike. That's, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the joke we've always said is one spare part. Be careful because if you have that one extra rear derailleur, it'll turn into a bike. Mm-hmm. So for me, though, going into this season, what are some of the things you guys have been dreaming up? I know for me, I keep going back to steel touring bikes. I miss a steel frame bike. I want one so badly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a, it's a great frame, but are you planning any touring this year? See, that's the hardest part is this is why the winter time is dangerous. You might think to yourself, I'm going to build this. I like, I might build a, a stump jumper. Will mm-hmm. I ever ride in Colorado in the next five years? No. no It'll look really have. shiny though uh, yeah. on, on my wall. Um, yeah, there you go. Well, you do have a shop that you can display it. So That's true, yeah. My bikes can rotate. They'll be used. So. Well, it's, it's hard for me to find something you don't have is I guess my point. That so, is true. And that's I'm at that point where it's, yeah, there really isn't a bike that I've seen for 2020 that I want to build. Except, uh oh, uh-oh. in my opinion, no good bike shop exists without a shop bike, yeah. and it's a random bike of random parts that gets assembled. A lot of it's very foolish. <laughs> a lot of parts are. I always prefer a wheel mullet. That would be uh-huh. a different size front and rear wheel. You just kind of piece it together. You make it rideable. You ride it around the shop and around the parking lot, and it's goofy and fun. Yeah, I, a, I'm I'm a big fan of sidecars. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm not going to be doing any mm. welding, so... Oh, I, f- I figured out how to do it with nuts and bolts. Oh. What? That just oh, yeah. damages the frame then, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can... I don't want to damage the frame. It won't damage the well, frame. <sighs> that, welding that's actually welding is not going to damage the frame. Well, Sorry, we're, you, we're sidetracking Well, I was going to say, for me, the one... I, I love the shop bike idea. The one that almost got me last year at this time is I was thinking, man, I have this carbon fiber kind of like tri-bike frame. Yep. And since I can't do anything cool since it'll only house a 25 millimeter rear, what if I put a fat bike front with a four inch (laughs) on a a carbon fiber triathlon road bike? And then I realized, okay, that would be cool, but it's also very dumb because that's not how traction works. At yes. all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Way, or way overpowered up front there. Yeah, there's just yeah. absolutely nothing good about that build if I did it. But that is a perfectly valid idea for a shop bike. Drop our fat bike with a 25 millimeter rear. Yeah, yeah. road yeah. road Perfect. disc carbon wheel. Like, <laughs> yeah, something very silly. And that's what, like, I've started to kind of piece together my parts and, you know, starting to put it together and it's going to be some amalgamation of a mountain bike and road parts. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Nice. Yeah. What about you, Merck? What's this? Because this is the time of year when you have all that time. Oh, and, all the time. and TC's right. It was more of cleaning up, putting frames, going, oh, this frame's broken. Oh, this is a <laughs> mountain bike frame. I can make a mountain bike to ride this year. So, yeah, I started gathering the parts together. Now, do you have another mountain bike so far? I do not. This will be my first and only mountain bike. Well, and that's actually a great thing because there's two ways I view this. Now, first of all, yes, we talk about when we have too much free time, we build bikes being in a bike shop. Mm -hmm. However, I think the same thing has been happening with a lot of our customers at our bike shop. When I got into cycling, Mm -hmm. my first bike that I had was given to me by you. And I was so happy riding road. It was just a very clear and present thing, a danger to my wallet, that I would be getting a better road bike. But I think for a lot of people, they start dreaming about the types of cycling they couldn't do. Okay, yeah. Or they haven't done. And so that's the, yeah, what is the second bike in your stable? And, you know, how does that uh, expand your ability and where and what you can ride? So if you have a road bike, cool. It'd be really great to have another road bike. 
or you could get a mountain bike and you yeah. could both ride road and mountain. Don't do Jeremy though and end up with three carbon road bikes because that's I, just kind of silly. But why too. not? Well, why know? not? Well, because I, I didn't have a mountain bike at the time. I okay, put my efforts but you into shouldn't rounding my experience. You know, like as much as I want you to, you shouldn't mountain bike. It's a dangerous game for you. <laughs> just because I crash so but, often. But going, you can have three carbon road bikes easily because you can yeah. have an aero bike. Aero. You can I have. Mean, every brand really makes three carbon road bikes. Yeah. So you can have an endurance bike and then you can have the. Super light climber bike. Thank you. Yeah. So this year is the, you're going to get back into mountain biking. I wouldn't say get back into mountain biking. Well, the reason but... I asked though is you said you found this frame. Yeah. Is this a frame you're just going to build for the off chance that you decide to mountain bike? Are you going to actually really try to get into I'm gonna, it? Well, I'm going to mountain bike more than I used to. It's not going to be, I'm getting back into mountain biking and that's what I'm going to do. It's the, hey, TC, you want to go mountain biking over by me? Yes. I have a bike now. I don't have to borrow one of yours. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes. Yes, we yeah, should go mountain exactly. biking. Exactly. <laughs> How do you make that decision between building up that older thing out of parts that you have just in case TC calls or going out and just building from scratch? I think my uh, with what's happening in my mind is I am buying new parts for it. If I start really getting into mountain biking, then what's going to happen is the frame will get retired and I will put a new frame on those parts. Well, the, re the reason I ask, though, is I just witnessed you going through a new track bike experience, Googling and going through every catalog to find the newest, latest, and greatest. Yeah, and that's still happening. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an ongoing project. That's right? always an ongoing project. Now, let's take a quick moment. This is the time of year you need to start thinking about what's going on with those cables for several reasons. So let's cut to TC and from the mechanic's mouth. Hey, everybody. TC here again. And today we're going to talk about cables. Once again, cables are generally stainless steel and they can start to corrode. Corrodes are our keyword today. Most commonly for us, you know, riding indoors in the winter, you got your sweat dropping onto the bike. That sweat, that salty, you know, salty moisture can start to cause corrosion and rust on most commonly the rear brake cable. So what you'll feel, you know, when you're riding that bike is as you pull the brakes, you pull the front brake, you pull the rear brake, you'll have more friction, more resistance in that rear brake lever. And that's going to be a good indicator that there's possibly some corrosion in the cable and the cable housing therefore. So that corrosion is not going to go away. It's best to replace the cable. And I really recommend bringing the bike into your bike shop, either looking at it or having your mechanic take a look at it and replace the cables if it is starting to corrode. And that's from the mechanic's mouth. All right. So before we go to our next segment, we're going to bring back something that we've been asked to bring back. People have been concerned about the amount of beer we've been consuming. So we have a beer for today, don't we? We do. We do. What do we got, Mark? We have the 2017 Bourbon County. Do you believe that Bourbon County has been produced by Goose Island since 2011? I actually do believe that because I believe I had the 2011. Did you? Yeah, I was drinking a lot back then. Oh, so yeah. this is Were fancy. you old enough? Yeah. Hey, hey. Uh, I turned 21 in 2011. Oh, there, there you go. go. Nice. It just sounds like such a fancy beer, though. So what do we know it about it, though? How do, it's how do a delicious feel? beer. So first of all, what we know about it, it is aged in Knob Creek bourbon barrels that are 11 years old. I don't oh, know exactly if that's, 11. Exactly. I don't know if that's important or not. It's 11-year-old Knob Creek bourbon barrels that it's and aged in. And handled with seven-year-old gloves. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Exacting standard beer. But it has a great, you know, nice vanilla flavor to it. Just this beautiful amber color and just really rich, really mm, dark. See. So delightful. It smells amazing. Yeah. And it's what, like 9%? Ah. But it gets fancy. Yeah. So let's see. If that's the 2017, it's 14.1 ABV. Good luck driving ah. home, gentlemen. That's why I'm having two ounce pour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that that's a good one. The problem is, though, nobody can really get that anymore. Is it still out there even for consumption? Um, well, so we did look this up and I did find you can buy four empty bottles so that's that there's no beer in them. They're empty bottles uh, on eBay for $120 for four empty beer bottles. Well, Ooh. there was one that was next to it. You missed it was $80 for an empty beer bottle for a, a full one. How much are we going to sell our empty beer bottle for? I don't know. I'm I thinking mean, like we'll do free shipping. Hit us on Instagram. What do you think? Yeah, top bitter. <laughs> I, I think since it's on a podcast, that's yeah, that's even more famous it's now. $50 oh, yes, now. Yes, Ooh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. for an empty beer bottle. So TZ, what did you find though, flavor-wise? What did you like about it? Yeah, it's a really nice, strong, rich vanilla kind of bourbon flavor to it, but it's, it doesn't have that harshness of the alcohol of like you know drinking bourbon straight. Yeah, so it's just a really yeah. nice, smooth, easy drinking. But for me, it's yeah, definitely in that like four to six ounce pour at max. Oh gosh, so yeah. I just want to no, sip, I want to enjoy, and then I'm already drunk because that's very <laughs> happens very quickly for me. So, are you imagining yourself by a fireplace? Yeah, like the bearskin snifter glass, rug. bearskin rug, leather bound books, smell of rich mahogany in the air. Um, 
Yeah, that that's uh, that's that's what I'm picturing right now. Yeah, nice, nice. Well, there you have it. If you get a chance to get one of those uh, bourbon county, then that's pretty amazing. Well, let's take a moment here. We've talked about having too much time on our hands. Let's talk about how you can interact with your bike shop. Let's go to bike shop hacks. Other than kind of planning out your repairs and things during the winter to avoid that seasonal rush that happens every March, April, what are some other things that we can tell our listeners to be a little bit smarter about how they interact with their bike shop? And so, yeah, right now is a great time to just come in and hang out and really kind of explore and get that really great personalized service because bike shops are slow in the Chicagoland area in the winter. And so I have ample time to kind of work with you and, okay, what are your goals? What do we want to do? With a few riders, we've already put together their plan for, you know, the new bike or the new wheels or just the race events that they want to do. We've put together a plan to get them, you know, the best possible success. So what about you, Merck? What are some other ways that uh, in the winter is a great time for customers to talk to a bike shop? Absolutely. I, TC's hit everything perfectly. Just come in, especially at the shop because you can have a cup of coffee yeah. and you just sit and talk. And we have ample time to sit and talk and talk about new tech that's coming out, old tech that's been out because that's my favorite thing I to mean, talk what about. I, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. I am more than happy to talk about it. Absolutely. I'm in the shop alone a lot. Yeah. A lot. And I so mean, I get really kind of cabin what I, 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 and, Yeah, I see you drinking your coffee, <laughs> doing your crossword. Man. Yeah. <laughs> my, my favorite thing is walking up to the shop. And TC pokes up from the, mm-hmm. the back shop and he's like, gets this big smile. <laughs> <laughs> I have somebody to talk to. <laughs> well, and for people who don't spend all the time at bike shops, yeah, that winter time, we've got all that time to explore it with. You want to talk about wheels? We can do wheels. Mm-hmm. You want you maybe some hands-on time to learn more to work on your bike? We can do that for you. But I think that's the hardest thing is, is everyone like, oh, the weather is 60. Let me pull that bike I threw away dirty, bring it into yeah. the shop, demand it be done in three days. That's always hard. Mm-hmm. We yep. can't always fit it. If you put it away dirty, you probably forget about that shifting. You probably forget about that cable issue. Get it done now in that February, March area. Yeah. No, that's absolutely I mean, yeah. right. Yeah. I, we can't repeat that enough. Yeah. Now is the time. And also, we're running a special. So labor there. rates can be less expensive in this time. Now, would you say just having gone, because I know you traveled across America, went to all yeah. different bike shops. Is that necessarily true at all bike shops that there's a season, off season? What about California? I'll say, yeah, like in, in seasonal shops, yeah, and, and seasonal is really the operative term there. So like, yeah, San Diego, guess what? It's going to be nice and you can ride nicely year round. It doesn't see the same lull that we do here in Midwest, but it does see a lull. It does right. definitely slow down. And I, I know that from my experience working at Specialized, ta- you know, talking with shops across the country. Right. I, I also love when a customer comes up though and they're like, hey, I've got this big thing I need to learn or this big project I want to do. When's a good time to yeah. talk to you about it? The answer might be for us right now. For someone mm-hmm. else, it might be like, hey, can we talk that in a month? Yeah. yeah Communication. Exactly. Yeah. And just talk and ask. And I hope they don't. But what's the worst they're going to say? No. Nope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I hope they don't. Yeah, I really hope, I hope shops they don't are either. trying to help you out and, yeah. you know, chase your goals with you. Because that's exciting for me. I'm really excited mm-hmm. for our sponsor writer, Mike Nichols. And for what he's planning out for this year with the transatlantic. Well, that's a great example of why we kind of brought up this this wintertime interaction because for him now last year we did provide him with a Roubaix. Yeah. So t- so a little outlier of what is his bike currently. And so yeah, his bike is yeah like like Merck's always talked about his Roubaix. Mike Nichols has the the previous model of that Roubaix Ultegra Di2, very similar build. But now what we've done in the winter is build it up for that Ireland trip that he's planning, that trip. So his goals, he wants to go to Ireland, how many miles? So it's uh, six days and 1,100 miles. So yeah. very demanding ride. Wow. It's not a race, it's a ride too. Um, similar to like what he did for Natchez, this is, you know, this is his big goal for the year. And so we need to figure out lighting solutions because the, the race organizers have specific light requirements. He has to have one steady and one flashing light. Right. Um, and so we went with, he built his first wheel. That was a dynamo you know, generator hub to produce electricity while he's pedaling. That'll power both his lights, and then when the lights are turned off, it'll power you know battery backup for his Garmin, for his cell phone. Mm-hmm. The solutions for an extensive, challenging ride like this are not simple. Right. You know, there's very few people in this world that have any concept as to, hey, you might want to do X, Y, and Z when you're riding 200 plus miles a day for six days, you know, or about 200 miles a day for six days. It's it's not a simple. Oh yeah, just grab this bike and you're good. You know, it's yeah. a lot of planning that goes into this, especially with the run with your brung, like you like Absolutely. to say. Yeah, is, well, he's flying across yeah. across the pond as it is, um, and so it's gonna be difficult for him to have a you know steady steady concept of what he can forget. So what have you had to modify on the bike to make sure he rides on the left side of the road? <laughs> Thankfully, nothing. Actually, did you moto it? Because I that's oh what yeah I heard. yeah swap yeah. the brakes for swap him the yeah, brakes, that, yeah that that, that he'll, he'll crash. Here, here's a couple of things too. As <laughs> I want you guys down. to really think about the reason that it was great to have that conversation when we have so much time too. Though is he's taking a carbon fiber bike. 
and he wants to go on this very long journey and a bike touring bike that's made of steel with tons of panniers that could work too, mm-hmm. but he doesn't have that. Right. So finding ways he can still transport it. Like, so for example, if we're not supposed to be clamping heavy racks onto a bike, mm-hmm. how is he getting away with transporting his clothes and feed bags and stuff like that? And so he went with uh, Caradice, which is a really kind of a fancy British brand that makes really, really nice cycling bags that mount to both handlebars and seat post. And so as we've got it set up right now, actually he is running a very large saddlebag on a carbon seat post. Thankfully That's he's not loading change. that yet. Yeah, we're going to put an alloy seat post on there. Uh, just because, hey, this is a that is a potential point of failure because he's got a lot of seat posts showing, and it's best to you know when we have this very strict regulation of six days, eleven hundred miles, mm-hmm. we want to be absolutely certain that nothing is going to impede his ability to ride that distance. And a broken seat post would definitely slow him down. Well, that was the coolest thing is though he brought us it early. Yep, we built custom wheels, but we didn't build it. He actually got he took that great he time to build it himself oh, as well so with the excited. Dynamo yeah. hub. And yeah. for all of you going Dynamo, yeah, bike packing if you can sit off the bike five six hours a day, a solar panel might work. Mm-hmm. In his particular case, where he's going to be riding those long long days and only going down only at in night, sunlight too. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's going to be a big problem. Well, so, hopefully there's sunlight in Ireland. Yeah, it's not Ireland, a lot. I hear yeah, they're well, not known well, for uh, sunburns too much with all the fair skinned people. <laughs> But that's a perfect example of how we could do something that was really on a personal level with one of our customers yeah. and, and one of our brothers. And I, yeah, I am so excited for his journey, for his experience. Um, I'm really, really excited for what he's going to do this year. That is going to be cool. Yeah. 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 That's, it's nuts. So you going to help uh, support that one? Oh, I'm not going to sag that ride. No, 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 no. no. I, I've smelled enough of Mike Nichols over two trips <laughs> on Nachez. I figured up we've done 888 miles together. The sag. That's part. yeah. That's yeah. just the yeah. sag part for Natchez. Not to mention the years of riding oh, together gotcha. as friends. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now let's cut over to Merck with another amazing story of triumph and woe. Let me tell you a tale of woe to triumph. This is about Johann Museo, the Lion of Flanders. Well, in 1998 at Paris-Roubaix, he was doing super well until he made it to the fabled forest of Arenberg. Unfortunately, the cobbles took their toll on him, crashed, and broke his kneecap. It was so bad, the doctor was going to amputate his leg. Well, thank goodness that they didn't, because he did train super hard to come back in 1999. Finished ninth at that year's race, but in 2000, that was his year. He came across the line in first after a 44 kilometer solo breakaway posting up with his arms in the air pointing at his knee saying hey look i just came back from a horrific crash finish this race first and going to show training is everything but now we're going to move on to something mark that's very important to you you've been very concerned about what's in people's bags Yes. yes. And a retail want, sense for want, theft, or what's your, what's your motivation? I want everybody? everyone to be safe. What is in your bag when you travel on a bike anywhere? Okay, so what do I carry with myself? There you go. With like, yourself. Well, well, okay. Wait, when I started because, like, or when I, now? Well, we'll get fair. to that. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm the minimalist. You are. So I have, and we actually, I was challenged on it this week uh, in the shop. So I carry one single tube, one CO2, and in the last... 10 years about where I've been carrying that little amount of gear, I have never been stranded on a ride with double flat. Yeah. And I'll, like everyone says, oh, you said that, so now it's going to happen. Oh, I've been saying that What's for years that and years work? and years. Yeah. yeah, single tube, the minimalist of anything that you could possibly think of. That's so what you I just bring one CO2 cartridge? One CO2 cartridge. Yeah. Just the cartridge? Just Well, I, I mean, I have my shiny object inflator and a Pedro's tire lever and a rubber band that holds it all together. Just like, checking. If we want to go well, that depth, so like, if, we're, if we're naming things, you are definitely the minimalist. Yes, and yeah. I'm definitely the Boy Scout. Yes. And the thing that bothers me, though, is all the years we've ridden together, I always look at him and go, that is so foolish. He only has one tube. What if? So I always carry double of everything. Now, part of that's for being a ride leader, because you yeah. should always have mm-hmm. something you can give away. But all these years, I'm watching TC like, oh, he's going to need it one day. I'm going to smile and smirk and hand it over. He hasn't ever needed anything. Proper inflation and all that. I'm kind of in between you guys. Mm-hmm. I have double flat it before. So having that extra- What caused it, though? Random or- Well, I was- The first one was I was car pacing with my friend. <laughs> motor pacing. Motor pacing. <laughs> and I- Explain that. Didn't realize that there was a pothole that he rolled over. So motor pacing is you're riding behind a car, dangerously close- uh, a car that Drafting you know the driver car. and that you I know the driver. with yes, them. Yes, that, that is correct. You're not bike messengering it. Yeah, no, no. We're not sketching. We're not holding the correct. wheel well. 
And you just, they slowly increase the speed in order to get to a certain speed. And at that point, I don't know how fast he was going. I've seen on, I've seen on the internet sometimes people do it with box trucks and stuff. They've mm-hmm. gotten mm-hmm. bikes up to a ridiculous yeah. speed. But what happens if you tap the brakes? Just the face plant at fifty miles an hour in the back yep. of the truck. Yep. It's Wiley Coyote time. So mm-hmm. that's why, like a lot of times, if you are motor pacing, we can do a little segue here, where you either have you have the driver, and then you do have a lot of times someone sitting kind of in the trunk, yep. able to signal to the cyclist any kind of thing that things that are coming up, like a pothole. Then you yeah, shift them in position been, because mm-hmm. roads are not perfect. No, nope. and that's actually any time that I have motor pace, we always scouted that road. Oh, carefully, very yeah. intently, well beforehand. Yeah, this um, was this was catching my friend. Yeah, at the end of his work day. Yeah, he's like, just driving yeah, home. Yeah, like, hey man, home. Yeah, gonna, exactly. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, he'll tow you home at thirty-five miles an exactly. hour. Exactly, <laughs> it's not unrealistic. So I do have the two twos because of yeah, incidents yeah. like that. And of course, the tire lever. I go one step further. I have the CO2 cartridge with the inflator and a pump. Okay. I can't yep. leave home without a pump. It's just, uh, it's one of those things. I've thought about that myself a lot of times because yeah, I've filled a lot of CO2. And one time I see a CO2 inflator that only worked on Presta valves. And one of our group riders was having a Schrader valve. Oh. And uh, I wasn't very helpful there. No. So yeah, that didn't work out. Luckily, someone did have a pump though. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, well, actually, doesn't the PDW, though, Portland Design Works uh, Shiny Object, work with both, I believe? I believe so. I believe yeah. you are correct. I don't carry the pump anymore, but yeah, it's nice when some other group ride does. How big yeah. is your pump? Uh, it's a small one now, okay. it, even though I do kind of want to go back to my, my ute and get the big old frame pump Yeah, that like fits right into the frame. <laughs> Takes up the whole top, too. Exactly. It's perfect. It's fantastic. I, I'm going to weld on a little knob on the on the head tube. That way it sits right in there. Yep. Little, well, for little me, though, the reason I go CO2 first, though, is when you're sitting there in the forest preserve, the sun's going down, the mosquitoes are coming out, and you're stopping for a flat, and you're taking a micro bullet pump and pumping it 400 times, that's not very fun. No. It, it is if it's me and you're stopped next to me because the mosquitoes come after you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sweet blood. What do you know? But then, so what is something else, though, that you would carry? Is there anything else you guys carry that you think is absolutely quintessential? Like, don't leave the bike shop with your first bike without. And small multi-tool. Yeah. Small multi-tool. Yep. And so for me, I've got a few between like the specialized EMT tools or my park tool IB2, which is the, one of the tools I've been using for a decade now. They have just pretty much everything, you know, Allen wrenches from like two millimeters to six and a Torx T25. And one of the things that's really fun to know about, hey, let's say you need an eight or a 10. Well, the math of six plus four, if you can put those two wrenches together, that adds up to 10 ah. and you can get things snug. You don't get any torque on it, but you can get it snug enough to usually limp home. And the, well, exactly. That's I. You said it correctly, TC. It's getting you home. Yeah. It's not getting you out further. Right. It's getting you home. Yes. Well, that's something I want to bring up real quick, though, because we have two amazing bike mechanics here, though. Merck oh, and TC. You guys oh, are thanks. both. You've been doing it for a very, very long time. I mean, there are decades of experience between you. Here's the thing I had a customer say to me, though. Jeremy, you told me to buy a multi-tool. I haven't used it in two years. So maybe we should outline, though, here's why a multi-tool is important. What are some of the things you can do to your bike on the side of the road that make it necessary? I mean, with my multi-tool, I can almost rebuild 90% of my bike on the side of the road. But so it's it's a lot of it's tightening things down. Hit a hard bump while riding and your seat post slips. You don't want to ride at your seat post two inches lower in the frame. Yeah. You want to pull it back up. So you you loosen it, pull it back up, tighten it back down. So, you know, seat post, saddle adjustments, all that little kind of fit, touch, and feel stuff. That's what the multi-tool allows you to easily adjust on the road. And for the amount of torque, those things are nicely, you know, usually required. That's the that tool, as hard as you can tighten it down, you're never going to exceed the torque limit. So it's a good tool for that. And that's generally speaking. Don't quote me on that. Right. I'm right. sure there's someone who's like Alex Honnold, someone with the most amazing grip strength <laughs> in the world, could take one of those tools and put 40 newton meters of torque on a handlebar and yeah. snap it. But what? generally speaking... Uh, the dude wow. can climb anything. Uh, you That's know, crazy. It's not a real person. And so it's ones where, yeah, like that, those small multi-tools, they're just an, yeah, enough to make small adjustments mm-hmm. and to, yeah, to tighten things down as need be. So TC always has his multi-tool. Merck, what is the thing that you would default to? That- I always go with two things, spare tubes and some kind of inflation system. To me, that's the most important things because going back to the multi-tool conversation, it's to get you home. So if you're flat, you can change your tube, get yourself home. I mean, granted, you can call Uber nowadays, but... <laughs> well, I think the thing that's so important, though, is if you're buying that bike for the first time, let your salesperson know. But let us know that you're new to it because there's a lot of things we can recommend for it. Like, in, And the thing is, too, is a lot of people, if they just 
ride their bike, they don't know how to change a tube. We meet people all the yep. time that don't know how. Don't be afraid to ask your bike shop if they have a clinic. I know we do. We have clinics every Wednesday there. For we you. also have training wheels. Yes, we do. We send home with people. Nice little bag. Did you say? Yeah, I said training wheels. Oh, well, tra- so oh, okay. Because it's, it's a wheel with a tube and a tire, and you can train yourself on fixing yeah. a flat. That's a fantastic idea. Because if you own one yeah. bike, you only own two wheels. And guess what? If you practice fixing a flat on your two wheels and you break one, yeah. and you break a tube, oh, nice. Uh, then you can't ride your bike. So training wheels are great for that. That was Thanks. your great idea, I think, when you I came out know. with a nice fancy wheel bag. And I yeah. mean, I have too many wheel bags, so yeah. You have too many natural. wheels. Well, that, nah, you can never have too many wheels. <laughs> no, that's, that doesn't a, that's, exist. A, that's a great idea because most people, they don't know how to change a flat. Yeah. They look at it and poke at it. and So, Merck, how many flats have you fixed in your lifetime? You had to estimate it. Guesstimate? I'm north of 10,000 is what Yeah, I'm I was going to yeah, say, I'm right. about 50 right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so here's a different thing I'm going to look at too. Now, TC, how many tubes, don't answer Merck yet, how many tubes do you actually patch? Do you sit at home on a Friday night and just patch tubes or do they go straight to the bin? I usually try to recycle my tubes mm. as opposed to going straight to the bin or upcycle them and build them into Wait. nice functional oh, bungee okay. cord thing esque things. Well, I haven't patched a tube for myself in a number of years. Yeah. I also don't get that many flats. Well, the reason I ask, though, is because sometimes these cyclists, we go back through generations, especially when it was big in the 70s and 80s, you didn't waste a tube. I mean, I've seen people come in, they have three or four patches on one tube. Is that your thing, Merck? Do you, do you still do that, or is it just... No, no. no? There's, there's many upcycled. There's a lot of there's a lot of drawer pools that are old inner tubes, and yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, yeah. I do have a question for TC, because mm-hmm. I do have an answer on for me. Yeah. How many patches have you seen on one tube? In person or in video? In person. Okay. Uh, the most I've seen was, I think, 12. Yeah, I'm yeah. about right there, too. <laughs> but I did see a video of Tom Ritchie yeah. uh, oh. in Rwanda, I want to say. And I saw someone on that video pull a tube out of a wheel, and there was 70. Oh, yeah, north of seven, patches. like all yeah. patches. It was like, it was <laughs> kind of hard to see what was, <laughs> what was tube and what wasn't patch. It was, <laughs> it was amazing, but it's just, you don't have the ready access to tubes that we do right. here, so you make do and keep First riding. world, second, third. There's, different, there's yes. different needs, and I think that's the thing I want to bring up. So if guys, if you haven't patched a tube, what are the most common things? I'll tell you this now. You guys have a lot more mechanical experience than I do. The two things I see people fail all the time when trying to patch a tube, A, they don't sand it. Yep. They're not mm-hmm. scoring yeah. it up. And then number two, they put that rubber cement on, pop that patch and extrude it down hard, and all of a sudden they wonder why it doesn't patch. Do you guys want to give some insight on that? For me... Always, when you when you do get a flat on the side of the road, don't attempt to patch it on the side of the road. Yeah, right. Patching a tube properly using you know the rubber cement and, and that kind of patch glue takes about 15 minutes to do it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something, yeah, you do at home after the ride. So you put your new tube in, you pocket your tube with a small hole in it, and then you, once you get home, then you patch it. So yeah, like Jeremy was saying, I mean, the A to Z process here is identify the hole. If it's a small puncture hole... Or a small snake bite. Sometimes with a snake bite, you can actually get both holes contained within one oh, patch. Oh, one patch, yeah. Patch kits come with, you know, a nice, uh, like, four or five different size or different patches. And the same part is just, yeah, to create friction to get better grip of the patch onto the tube. And then, yeah, that small rubber cement. Most folks, I mean, the rubber cement is going to be the first thing that's going to go wrong, go get old and go yeah, bad. get hard. Half the time that you buy a patch kit, it sits for three years. Yeah. And then it's just junk. But, hey, you didn't use it. But it's always good to have one. Yeah. For me, it's ones, yeah, score up that right around that hole, right where you can identify it, um, apply rubber cement to that area, and then put the patch on top of that and hold it firm for about five, six minutes. Well, the thing, too, is everyone who tells me patches don't work, when you're on the side of the road and you've got that flat, you're impatient. Yeah. When you put that rubber cement on and you you smear it around to the shape, you can't immediately at that point, it's, it's too fluid slam that patch on or there's really no rubber cement between that patch and tube you have to let it get tacky for a good minute before you apply it yeah i think that's absolutely right the a lot of people don't understand that with rubber cement is they do have to let that dry a bit in order for it to work going back to the scoring even with even tacking even with the um the the glueless yeah patches you still have to score up that tube in order for that glue to adhere to the tube yeah I mean, I go back to the days of, uh, you might too, you put the rubber cement on, you light the lighter. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, you dry it that way. It's and getting then the you farmer s- point at that too. Exactly. <laughs> tubes, yeah. But that's something definitely too. So then what I'm thinking is if you have a multi-tool, you have your tube, you have your tire lever, and you know how to use them, it covers most side of the road mm-hmm. things. Would you say that's true? Uh, I, I agree. What do you think? Yeah. Mechanically, yeah, anyhow, as far as you'll go. 
But there's more to just what you carry for mechanical sense because it's something you learn as you go and you progress. I know that now being in cycling for, I don't know, over six years now, I've learned to do so many things I couldn't do when I started. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about that. It's the gear. It's the clothing. There's so many other accessories that you might have. What is something, Merck, that you've kind of picked up across the years that you're cycling thing that you wouldn't want to go without these days? Oh, there's a couple of things, in all honesty. Ah, what are they? Going going back to the day where I just first started riding, I had no idea there was such thing as padded shorts. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. difference. Big, big difference big now. Difference. We didn't game have those changer. as kids, not while we did as babies, but there's a difference. Yeah, big game changer for me. And the then the other thing is, as I'm getting older, the more and more I go out with a helmet, even if I'm riding around the block, yeah, yep. I, I throw a helmet on. Always. Yeah, it's just one I of those things. I think it's called wisdom because I do the oh, same thing. Is I actually will take a little, not shot, but I'll, I'll tell the customer, like, oh, I'm just going to go test ride real quick. Do you want to borrow a helmet? No, no, it's fine. Will you <laughs> no, put no. a helmet on Can for me? Can you put a helmet on? <laughs> oh, well, and that's the other thing is a lot of people do have to check your helmets. Check right. your helmets every year. Even if you don't get into a physical crash, I'm klutzy in all honesty. I've dropped my helmet multiple times. And even... The that nicest, can cause damage. Yeah. Even the nicest, ex- most expensive helmet I had to get rid of because I cracked the shell because I dropped it too many times. Well, here's one, TC, and, and you've done this so lovingly. I think you're kind of like a guardian angel when it comes to this. How many bikes have come in for repair that you'll see someone's helmet and then passively mm-hmm. kind of get them a new helmet? It happens quite a bit. Well, so, I mean, yeah, helmets that have, generally speaking, about a five-year shelf life. You know, when I've seen helmets that have been much older than I am, um, and I'm not five years old... Uh, so those should really should be replaced. And it, it's just ones where the person is perfectly well-intentioned in putting on that helmet because that's part of their process. Mm-hmm. But the education as to, hey, that right. uh, you know, ethyl, ethyl polystyrene, the EPS foam that's inside of that helmet has degassed and is no longer protective and is really just putting a styrofoam bucket on your head. You know, that's that's where it gets to. And so person who comes in with a helmet that's that old, it, it's it's not... I, I mean it in no way. It's just really, yeah, it's just education. And yeah, it is education. Know, because I've been in the industry for 12 years at a high level at a you know helmet manufacturer at one point, yeah, you really get educated on what's safe and what's not. And it's it's something where, yeah, it's just, it's very helpful. But one of the things that kind of back to the, yeah. you know, what do what do I carry? Um, and for me, it's cash money. Oh. Cash money. Cash money. So <laughs> specifically, I mean, about five, 10 to $20 bill. Right. Having one of those with you. And so when I did have a saddlebag. When? <laughs> well, it's, it's years ago. It's too heavy now. Man. We're like eight it's years, eight years no, no, back. No, 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 no. It's, it's aesthetically unpleasing. Exactly. That's correct. That, yeah. that is my opinion. And so when I had a saddlebag, I had a 20 in there always. Because that's enough money to, you know, get a cab. Don't you do a lot food, of things. Yeah. yeah. But also, we all know that uh, at least a 20, if not a 50 or a 100, when you have to put it, fold it up and put use it as a tire boot, yes. that yeah. higher denomination bill just is obviously strong. Well, so for those of you and who don't joke, know what the way. boot is and what it is for, though, is yes, if you get more than a puncture in your tire, a cut, cut where the tube the starts tire. bulging or the tire starts bulging, you can use a dollar bill in there. Mm-hmm. So you fold it up. You know, For me, it's folded in half and then folded half again. Generally speaking, that's going to be uh, the hamburger way. We're we're gonna use that, oh, okay. that nomenclature. Hamburger versus hot, yeah, dog. hot dog versus hamburger. Yeah, yeah. So the the hamburger way you fold it twice and half the hamburger way. Um, that allows you know a nice like one inch by about two inch kind of nice reinforcement patch to put inside of the tire. You know, in between the the new tube and the tire itself to protect from that tube bulging out and causing yeah. a flat. Therefore, yeah. good old tire boot. Now, if you're really baller though, could you just coat the inside of your tires with all hundos? I, just I mean, all the inside puncture protection by Ben Franklin. <laughs> all the Benjamins on there. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, yes. If you're trying to like hide money from the IRS, I guess that's <laughs> yes, one inside way of doing your I, I was thinking well, the same thing. <laughs> you know. Well, thanks, TC. April, they're going to be calling us now. Yeah, yeah. they're going to they're going to go into the shop and just start cutting open every, every single tire. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Now let's cut to Greg, who did some interviews at Captain Midwest. Listen, guys, this is Greg at the Crank Revolution Podcast. I am at the Yakima booth, and I'm talking to Matt to understand what is the cool products in their booth and what can we do to uh, help promote this and really make you want to be excited about this. Personally, I'm a fan of the brand, but you know what? Let's have Matt tell us about it. Matt, thanks again for coming on the show. Tell me a little bit about the uh, road shower you have here. Absolutely. Road Shower is a great new product. It's a brand that we actually acquired in December. Um, Rave reviews on the product online. 
the, the actual use in field. It was so great, we didn't want to have to you know, navigate their patents and create our own product. So we did acquire Roach Shower in December. It comes in a four, seven, and 10 gallon option. Well, um, for, the, for those that aren't here, what does the Roach Shower look like? The Roach Shower is a nice aluminum black cylinder that's gonna to mount to your roof rack. And it's gonna give you the, the ability to have pressurized water on the trail, on the road, to clean off your dogs, your kids, your girlfriend, whatever you got. So if I am really into camping, I like the outdoors, or if I'm gonna go mountain biking for a week straight and I don't wanna just use handy wipes to keep myself clean, yeah. I can actually take a shower on the go. Absolutely, yeah. We actually have an accessory shower head to attach to the unit. I um, see that. That actually looks like something that's gonna give you a pretty decent spray down. This isn't like staying at the Holiday Inn and you get the economy wash. Absolutely. You get a nice breeze. Just make sure you have some good privacy. You don't wanna end up on a list. <laughs> um, but otherwise, it does come standard with a hose, which is a great feature to clean off whether you're paddling, whether you're cycling, um, whether you just need to clean off your hands. It's and so how, what's the capacity of the road shower? So the model that we're looking at is seven gallons. Okay. Um, there's a four and a ten option as well. All so right. This model here retails for uh, $440. And which model is this that we're looking at here then? This is the seven gallon. So if I were to fill up the seven, ga a seven gallon, I've got water, I have this, how much is that going to weigh on my roof rack? Because weight is always that key factor. Absolutely. It's going to take up about 80 pounds of your total total weight capacity. But I mean, you really put the price on the comfort behind of what you're gonna get out of totally. There. Now I see that we have a uh, thermometer on here. Tell me a little bit about what's the goal on this one, because everybody likes a good shower, but why include that? What's the thought on this? So we don't provide any ability to heat this product. Um, we use uh, Mother Nature to do that, just standard sunlight. So we did powder coat this nice, uh, it's a flat black that's gonna capture that sunlight. It looks like you could cook an egg on this. It might be, you know, depends on where you're at. Arizona might, might be able to cook an egg. This is just a standard 3M sticker that's got that temperature gauge. It's gonna highlight the temperature, let you know whether you're gonna be cold or hot at the end of the day. I love a good shower. That's just what it is at the end of the day. I don't Absolutely. think anyone would argue with that. Now, let's say we walk over here in your booth. Tell me about this cargo box. So the Grand Tour is a welcomed addition to our cargo box lineup. This is a newer product that uh, it's going to actually be starting to ship next week and will be available in retailers. So we're February 20th. People can go to their local bike shops. They can go to wherever they would expect to find your brand. Then. Absolutely. We have a dealer locator. We can. It, it'll absolutely tell you where, can, where you can find the Grand Tour. We've got a hard case rooftop uh, enclosure. This is, looks like it's pretty sizable. What's the capacity for this one in terms of size and we're then weight? We're gonna have a 15 cubic foot option, a 16 and an 18. The 15 is actually gonna come in, uh, it's what we call it the Alpine series. It's gonna be a lower box designed for more of a ski or snowboard user. Um, the nice part about that, you're not gonna get any road salt or any road grime on your freshly tuned boards or skis. Well, yeah I, yeah, I could spend a little bit of money on those. Absolutely. Actually, my dentist is a skier. That really tells you how much money you can spend on it. That's right. And the lid of these, uh, this is Yakima exclusive. We have metal ribs that are gonna make our lid nice and stiff. So you get extra security, extra stiffness in the lid, just helping you close it and have better interaction with the product. And then it looks like we have a, a one lock on just one side. Does this open from both sides or only on a single side? Absolutely. There's a safety feature within the handle to where you cannot lock your keys in the box. The key will only come out if it's in the lock position. And for the handle to be locked, the cargo box has to be closed. So there were too many boxes on the early on the early side that were getting, you know, keys get locked in there. All your engineers just well. had to Uber home until the locksmith came? Absolutely. I know how yep. that goes. Yep. For this box, where's this one made? So this is made in Riverside, California. So this is an American product. Absolutely. So that's pretty exciting. So that way, if you really care about supporting American jobs or just uh, American manufacturing, yep. I love it. Well, Matt, thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. You're welcome. And uh, I hope everybody out there takes the time to check out their website because these are some pretty innovative products that I think you would enjoy on your personal gear. Thanks again, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my friends, that has been another episode of the Crank Revolution podcast. First thing we'd like to say is thank you. Thanks for being our listeners and sharing the show with your friends. Leave us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. We love the feedback. You can reach out to us by email at crankrevolutioncycling at gmail.com and find us on Facebook at Crank Revolution.